Um, before we proceed, I just want to acknowledge that um, Klugiru is located on the land of the Monica Nation, and we pay our respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. And since we're all joining from locations around the world, I just want to acknowledge all of the indigenous nations where each of us are located. And I encourage you, if you don't know who your local indigenous people are, that you find out um, and that you learn about them and their art and their culture. Um, so thanks for that. Um, this is the third webinar in a series where we're hearing from artists about their new and recent work, what it's been like for them in quarantine, um, and what new ideas they are exploring in their arts practice. Um, I'm really excited to get to introduce Jenny Martinello today. Um, I was really honored to get to spend some time with her when she was um, a resident artist at the Kujiru Aboriginal Art Collection um, back in 2018. And um, not only did I learn a whole lot about the medium of glass, um, I, that was like, you know, crash course in glass um, for me, which was great. But um, she also was the person who introduced me to Monica Honey, which I'm really grateful for as well. Um, <laughs> and um, I'll, I'm gonna start with a brief introduction of her and then I'm gonna hand it over to Jenny and we will get started. So um, Jenny Kamar Martinello is an award-winning orange of visual artist, poet, writer, and photographer. Um, she is of orange, Chinese, and Anglo-Celtic descent. She was NADOC Artist of the Year in 2010. She was awarded the Canberra Critics Circle Award for Visual Arts in 2011 and also in 2013. Um, in the same year, she won the actual prestigious Telstra Prize for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander art. Her works are held in numerous public and private collections, including the National Gallery of Australia, the Australian Parliament House Collection, the National Museum of Palau, the National Art Gallery of the Solomon Islands, the Corning Museum of Glass here in the States, and the British Museum. She is represented by Sabia Gallery and Paul Johnstone Gallery in Darwin, Australia. So without further ado, welcome Jenny. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'll, I'm gonna hand it over to you. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and um, I will let you share yours. Okay, terrific. Well, thank you. And even though I can't actually see who is in the room, I've got, you know, the, the counter participants there, which is great. Um, I'm, I've got a, uh, a, just a run through of some of the work I've been working on since I was at Clue Room in 2018, which was lots of fun. Um, and some of the questions that um, Lauren, sent me um, was, you know, how has COVID affected um, everything? Not so badly. Um, Canberra's been very lucky in that we've only had, um, I mean, we have no current cases now. We've only had 105 cases um, in the whole period, which is great. Australia's been very good um, in terms of very few cases and very few deaths. I mean, the Canberra and, and this region has only had, um, I think, you know, 105 cases and out of those only three deaths, which has been excellent. But nevertheless, we've been all wandering around with masks and gloves <laughs> and things. Um, and things are opening up slowly. So for example, I've been able to use the, um, the Glassworks, the studio, the hot shop being closed, but because that's kind of teamwork, but everything else has been open for artists, but most of us have been sensible. And um, we've stayed away. Um, so one of the things that I've been working on, this is the photograph of a bark basket in Coogie Roo collection there. A Charlotte's film, and I've been given a commission by the um, from the Museum of Applied Arts and Sciences at the Powerhouse Museum in Sydney to create some new work for their collection. And one of the things that I've 
been really, really interested in over time has been the bark baskets. Um, where I've concentrated on weaves before, I can works like this, I can kiln form. Um, and I'm doing test pieces now. That was a detail. This is also in the Kluge Roo collection, um, which is really lovely. So I'm working on some designs that will look at the design features of these and how they, I can reproduce those. The test pieces that I've done so far is blowing a design in a cylinder and then cutting it and opening the cylinder out to a flat panel in a kiln. Um, and then I can drill holes around the edges and I can actually use native fibers to weave them together. So I'm looking at that, but they have to be slumped so we get a rounded shape. So that's another level. This is um, <coughs> in the Museum of Applied Arts and Sciences in their collection, which is another absolutely stunning bark basket. It's a gorgeous thing. So looking at the various designs from different places is giving me lots of really interesting inspiration to work on. Um, so they're the test pieces I'm working on at the moment. and. I envisaging there's I can do the hot blown and kiln formed um, test pieces. I can do test pieces made with bullseye glass, which is in um, it's it's a that comes in sheets of glass, which could be cut pieces cut into designs and fused together and slumped and then um, woven. Then there's also using float glass, which is like window glass with enamels for the designs. So I've got plenty to do <laughs> apart from the regular hot line works. Um, this piece, the Sedgwick's fish basket was on show at um, the Corning Museum of Glass in upstate New York for a year as part of their um, New Glass 2019 collection so it was their 60th anniversary so every year they do a call out for artists to send examples of their work from around the world and every year they choose 100 pieces to go in a journal so last um for their 60th anniversary they had those works created to the museum to go on show for a year so that was the piece that went so was very and it's a bit different to the fish basket that you have on show at the moment because um this is a long way where the other one that you have is a multi-strand one these are voice calls that were um Jenny, craft act Jenny, a, really quick before you go on i just wanted to comment on the fact that you said that we have one of your works on view and that is true everyone we we do have if you're if you're local to us we do have one of jenny's works on view unfortunately no one has been able to see it yet because we cannot be open right now but we do have some images of the installation of that exhibition and we are planning to do a little virtual tour of that exhibition um, sometime in the next couple of months especially if we can't open for a while so i just wanted to disclaim that we are not open and unfortunately you cannot go see that in the flesh but stay tuned for <laughs> other ways to explore it soon <laughs> thanks sorry okay thanks lauren that's good um Craft ACT is um, like a lot of the guilds and associations for professional artists and they every year they have a members show. Uh, the one for 2019 was called Visionaries. Um, so you have to submit. So these were what I call voice calls. They're hot blown glass and the idea behind um, the, the voice cause is um, that you know in, in geology you think 
cores down into the earth and bring up samples to go back into deep time and identify, you know, things about the people who lived in those times and about the geological structure. <clears throat> so my thought was, what instead of you bringing up earth and, and rocks and artifacts and those cores, that what you brought up was um, the sounds of the first voices for those places. And so each of these represents um, a particular place and I've used colour selections that belong to those places. And the idea is that, you know, sort of rounded forms are like the vowels and the lines are more like consonants. And so trying to get visually something of the, 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 the place by colour, but also the lyricism of the first song cycles and stories for those places. So for example, the one on, on the right is um, Red Gibber Desert, which is in the far north of South Australia. Um, and uh, the second one from, or the third one from um, the right is Mungo, after Lake Mungo. Um, the one on, in the second from the left is Tarkine, which is after the Tarkine Valley um, and the great old growth forests in Tasmania that we have to keep fighting for them not to log and so forth. And the one in the middle is, um, has got heavier dark lines in it which represent kelp, so it's Palawa, so from Tasmania. So I'm trying just to capture something of the essence of each place. So they were new works in since I came home. You might like to see all these American coins from, <laughs> one of the things we have is an honouring cultures uh, First Nations jewellery project where we're in partnership with the Australian National University and their jewellery and object workshop and we've had this is an ongoing project we started in 2018 um, progressed through last year we're about to do some online workshops for this year but we've worked with various jewellers on some of the finer um, ways of, of how would we combine traditional ways of making jewellery with contemporary fine jewellery making. So one of the things I learned was how to, you, how to pin things. So this is actually a necklace that um, is with my American coins that I bought back from <laughs> from my visit so um, hey, Annie, I want to stop you before you go forward because yeah. there are some interesting things that on these coins that you saw when you were here right so yeah this is Jamestown on this coin that you visited yes. yeah so that's very that's interesting right. right colonization of the United States and then this is uh, Monticello right so yes so you you've chosen some are these are all things that you brought back you said Yes. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Cool. Really cool. So, um, yeah, it's kind of capturing a little bit of my journey there, which is great. And, whoops, I'm not sure what's happening here. Um, sorry, I just decided to do something funny. Um, and then following on from my fish traps. Um, this is actually cast bronze as a pendant. Um, so using a lost wax process, um, which is a little bit like the casting process in glass. This is given, you know, I sort of follow the theme, stay with what you know. Um, this is a fishnet pendant and what I was able to do, the casting process in jewellery making is, the, the, is very fine and it picks up lots of details. So this is a piece of a fishnet I bought back from the Solomon Islands actually, <laughs> around a, a World War II glass buoy um, that was used in fishing. 
and I cut pieces off and had them cast and I picked up the, the twining and the fibers and really, really well. So playing with these things has been interesting. Um, also the idea of dilly bags, again, this is cast white bronze. So it looks like silver, but it's heavier. Um, being able to play with these ideas um, just opens things up and, and then you can take different ideas back again into glass. Um, I belong to a group of um, Indigenous and mainstream artists and poets and we've been working on projects with each other for um, probably two years now. Um, and it started out as a collaboration with a, a composer and a musician here in Canberra around the stories that he'd been collecting from Indigenous and other cultural groups about the sky and what the stars mean. So we call it Postcards from the Sky. So this was from an exhibition and this is my other things that I play with when I want to break from the rigors of glass because glass is very rigorous. Um, this was called Music of the Spheres um, and that's an old Greek philosopher's idea that the planets move around each other in this kind of metered musical way. Um, but it's a, it's a Celtic harp and so with my identities as an Aboriginal Chinese and Anglo-Celtic, the harp itself is the Celtic part. And then <clears throat> the details that I've done on there is the dark emu in the Milky Way on one side. Um, and on the other side is the Chinese dragon, which is a Chinese constellation. So it makes them an, an identity sculpture. So it was a great way of incorporating those ideas. Um, the other piece from um, that is um, Karankaranka, which is like what I would make the Seven Sisters and our Kamari Arts women's group also have been concentrating on making objects from uh, sculptures from found objects, um, keeping things out of landfill. Um, so this is actually the big sister. I started out, I was going to do the seven sisters. And so this is the big sister. Um, and because I worked um, on her while she was lying down spread between chairs, I didn't realize how tall she was till I <laughs> stood her up. She's nine feet high. So she's very tall. <laughs> so she hangs up on the wall beautifully. Um, and her body is made from an old television aerial and the frame for the head is um, the frame around a domestic fan and there's squash rackets for the, the arms and feet and then woven together and incorporating LED lights which flash on and off and, and it looks really nice. So there'll be more of those. I've got the other six sisters to go yet. <laughs> um, but that's um, another new series of work has been Feather Nest Sky. Um, these were in an exhibition at Sabia Gallery in 2019. Um, and I got really interested in just watching um, how, what wind does, not just to you know, the leaves and the branches and things like that. But in terms of the way feathers move on wind and things like that. So we started as a series of these that are all slightly different. There's the blue one um, that's from Feather Nest Sky as well. So they're all representing slightly different seasons and times of the year as well. Um, so to be able to incorporate those and using the bicornual shape as well um, as a traditional basket shape. <coughs> 
Um, every year, Sabia Gallery in Sydney has um, a group exhibition called Masters of Glass, and every year it has a different theme. So last year the theme was Hot Shop, and so we had to show some photographs of the work in progress. So the Feather Nest Sky pieces were in the Hot Shop exhibition. This is um, what happens when you set the Marini up, the small pieces of glass which have been, the patterning has been constructed already on a metal plate called a pastorelli and that's ready to pick up in the hot shop around a hot bubble of glass. And so that's what it looks like. <coughs> so something like this ends up looking like feather nest sky once it's been picked up and so and can create you, it. Jenny, really quick, just because because I got to watch this whole process, I, I feel like there's so much work that's been done pulling cane, right, to get to this point. Can you explain that a little bit for people, just in case they're not quite familiar with that process? Yes. It's, it's, you start off with colour bar, and, um, which is coloured glass. Um, and you have to pull it in in the hot shop. You heat it and pull it up in out into long canes, and then you combine those canes into different combinations, and you pull them again. So, and then you will do the same again, depending on the combinations that you want. So, you will see um, Marini in there, which look like lots of little dots, um, especially along the base. Uh, the bottom of the picture, and those are just bundling up lots and lots of single canes and heating them and pulling them and into another cane and then chopping them up so you get cross sections. The other ones where you see circles clustered together and shapes is making um, triple canes, so wrapping three layers of canes around each other and pulling them, then cutting those up and bundling those again together so that you, when they open up, you've got um, different types of shapes and forms um, in the glass blowing process. So lots of work, as you say, lots of preparation. So four fifths of making your work is in this preparation. And for and those of you, I just wanted to add in, Jenny, for those of you who don't know what, what have never seen someone pull cane, it's, it's, a, it's a tube of glass and they heat it up and they literally stretch it out to people. Mm -hmm. And so when she's talking about pulling cane, she's doing that and you do that and then you bundle them together and then you often do that again. And then she's cross-sectioning, cutting them. So what we're yeah. seeing here is the inside of that cross-section. It's a little mm -hmm. hard to visualize if you've never seen it. Yeah, we do, have, how. we do have a little video from the Chrysler Museum of Glass. When Jenny was here, she did a little residency there too, and they, they produced a nice little video. So if you check out the collaboration um, that we did with them and with her, you can watch that process. So Jenny, how, how much time do you think has gone into pulling just the cane that we are seeing in front of us here? In this image? Um, there's been, goodness, probably more than 40 hours of pulling canes and then cutting them and combining them. And so it's a lot. <laughs> so there's a lot of work into, and this, that's the Marini that I put together to make one piece. Um, another image is after you pick them up on a collar and you've gathered glass over them and they're on the end of the, the the blowpipe. Um, you go through a series of shaping that again, you have wooden blocks with, with hollows carved out of them that you roll that in when it's, while it's hot and molten. Um, what's happening there is that you're constantly pulling the canes towards the end to keep them even and then you chop off the bit that you don't need at the end and that bit is, um, goes in the annealing kiln and I use those as paperweights. So they don't get wasted because they're really pretty. Um, so, you know, the hot shop itself is a really long process 
and lots of fun. Um, uh, one of the, I think I had another <coughs> exhibition in Darwin at Paul Johnston Gallery in August last year during the Darwin Festival. This was um, the Spill Basket, which is, um, was a way of using those marinis slightly differently. The ones you saw on laid out on the Pastorelli were all very neatly laid out. And that this one, you make that space on the Pastorelli and you just tip the pieces in and let them fall whichever way. And then you get cross sections and side sections. And so this is um, about 34, centimeters high it's um and that went to darwin as part of uh the ex the solo exhibition there which was called ecology tradition art so again that's drawing on forms and you know bush flower um forms and colors so um last craft act in conjunction with um Mr. Lawrence, which is a curatorial firm in Milan in Italy, uh, last year put together, at the end of last year, put together the Glass Utopia exhibition, which is six Australian and six Italian glass artists. So that exhibition has shown in Canberra, um, traveled to Tasmania, to Launceston, um, it was to have gone to Milan and Venice, which that side of things is postponed that we're hoping will happen um, at the end of this year or early next year. So it's a traveling exhibition and it's, um, there's just two small works. So this um, is a small eel trap and I had large eel traps in the exhibition in 28 at Kluge Road, this is um, about a third of the size of those. So it's um, for reasons of economy and traveling, it's easier to ship small things. Um, and this is the shell weave dilly bag. Um, this is a side view of the dilly bag that is also in that exhibition. And I understand that one sold in Launceston, so now I have to replace it if, it's, if the exhibition's going to go off to, to Italy. Hey, hey Jenny, I, I have a question about this work just while we're on this yes. slide. Is we, I don't know if you knew, we just did a whole exhibition of fiberworks um, at Kluge Roo, and so um, is the shell weave a traditional um, technique? Um, the, loop, the, the loop weave is a traditional technique, but um, because in the, you can't make glass canes, actually, you can't weave them the way you would grass and things like, and, and reeds, you can suggest the weave mm -hmm. in the glass. And so you get all kinds of variations. So while you aim for a loop weave, um, you will get variations and it just happened that in this piece the variations looked like shells okay. Okay. so which is why i called it a shell weave um so but some traditional weaves are really very intricate and it's really hard to do anything close to those in glass so this is a, this is you know the the best you get <laughs> So there's loop weaves and long weaves and twisted weaves and um, this was this is actually on the, the table in the glass works after they've been cold worked but this was um, a collection of larger pieces um, the fish traps that I did one of them uh, the one on the right actually has gone to the National Library of Australia um, that was prese presented to them by the friends of the library as, um, as a birthday 
present. So it's a significant, I think it's 70 years for the National Library. So that was their anniversary. Um, a couple of the, the lying down one, the reclining yellow one at the front went to an exhibition in, at Sabia. Um, in sort of Sabia moved their gallery to a new space, one in, in Redfern, which is a really nice space. So they had an alumni exhibition, uh, which was a group exhibition of glass and ceramic artists. And so that one went off there and um, did several other pieces. So that one's gone to a new home. That one was actually cold worked before it left. So it was sandblasted and sanded back. So it had a lovely, matte satin finish on it which was lovely um, and you can see the glassworks that's the upstairs level of camera glassworks it's the old powerhouse so you can see and this is um, basically the area for cold working and kiln forming and down the back um, there is for flame working so you can see we've got lots of nice space and the hot shop is down on the next level and then the mold room and the noisy cold shop is done on the bottom level. So we've got lots of space. So during COVID, when only a few of us would go in at a time, it was like a, a mausoleum because there weren't more than six of us through the whole building. So, <laughs> so we didn't even get to see each other. Um, these are the new hanging long weave dolly bags and, you know, again from the Kugi Ru collection and other baskets I've seen um, that they look beautiful if they're hanging. And so the idea was to combine weaving with the glass. So this is a long weave um, pattern in hot blown glass. And I've woven with raf uh, native flax and raffia and incorporated uh, some quandong seeds there. So there was a, there's a series of six of these and they went, um, Sabia um, had their first First Nations um, glass, um, fibre ceramics glass exhibition. Um, in so December to January, um, just this last December to January. So these were some of the works included in that. Um, so it's been a lot of fun incorporating the weaving with the glass. And so there's more of these to come. This is another loop weave one, which again, you can see that kind of almost shell-like um, pattern has come out in the canes. And um, I think that's one of my favorites. It's a really nice one. And this one, the other two were cold worked. So they had that matte satin finish, but with this loop weave, I think I've left them as they were. That's another loop weave. And you can see that looks slightly different, that pattern in it. But again, the same uh, native flax and raffia. Um, so I've learned how to process the native fibres as well and make sure they stay flexible for weaving. So I've extended some of my skills in the last year. Um, this was also in that exhibition. I've done a series of warrior poles in kinform glass. This is... Um, the Rainbow Warrior Pole, which has, um, and you can't really see it from the slide, but down the sides are inscribed the names of our resistance heroes from the frontier wars. And they're First Nation. So, and it's a woven warrior headband with emu feathers that surround it. Um, and the traditional warrior um, Weapons that are on there are actually applied with oil pigments. So after the kiln forming. So it's another step out incorporating some extra media. Um, that one has gone to live in the Philippines. It's two meters high. 
So. Is that a, um, a map as well near the top? Yes, it's a, it's a look at country and um, in particular the, the First Nations around um, the first landing at Botany Bay, or Kame, which is the Aora name. And are those designs drawn on there then, or are they yes, applied? They're, they're, they're drawn. Yeah, they're, yeah. yeah. So this is the warrior poles, actually, I did some in 2015, and then I've now come back to them. Um, when we were uncovering the hidden stories of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander men who fought in the First World War. And we had a lot of Aboriginal men who went off to war and died in France and Flanders. And in particular, we had whole families of men. So the fathers and brothers and cousins and uncles all enlisted. So this is a play on um, you know, we have our traditional burial poles, which is a traditional monument. But um, I've also incorporated some of the colours of the seasons that war was fought in France and Flanders. So when they were sent over, it was spring, so there was a bright green in the grass, um, which very quickly turned to mud and sludge. And they say the mud was a grey-green sort of mud um, and then the gray in the sky from the winter skies I've also added um, you know the, the traditional remembrance flower is the poppy the red poppy for the first world war <coughs> so what we've I've done is found silk flowers and cut the petals to go on in those linear patterns in some synthetic fibres because the a lot of our traditional burial poles in different places, apart from the designs, will have um, resins with feathers and ochres on them as well as the designs. And that's about as close as I can get um, if you know, if they, one of the considerations is um, when these poles actually sell, if the buyer is overseas, you have to think about import restrictions on natural substances and fibres. Um, so <clears throat> that's why they're synthetic. And again, there's war in those um, bands because there are the oil pigments, uh, images of the traditional weapons. And the barrel, it, it, as it also sort of alludes to the barrel of um, the ordnance, the, the big guns that we used on the, in the First World War as well. So there's lots of symbolism. Hey, Jenny, I just, wanted to, is, I just wanted to say really quickly, I think these are fascinating um, because I remember when you were at Plugy Root for your residency, you, you were talking to me and to our audiences about Aboriginal um, men and women who who served in the um, who served like in the military, and at that point, I mean, I don't I don't know that there are that many, if any, artists that are engaging with that history and with that and like with and with um, and with um, and with uh, that legacy. So I think I'm I'm really excited. I was wondering, like, I wonder she'll make some works in glass about that so I'm really excited to see these and to and to also see how you connected them to the memorial poles um, from that are made in in Arnhem Land um, or how how large are these again can you just remind they're us two that? meters high two meters oh yeah so they're about the same size as a memorial pole would be yes yeah yeah wow okay cool so they have a lot of uh, presence so this one is the biggest Sheba Pole. In the First World War, um, the, um, the, the horse regiments, the mounted cavalry, actually um, were full of Aboriginal stockmen because they were so such great horsemen. 
And in fact, the 11th Light Horse Regiment was dubbed the Black Watch because it was almost all Aboriginal men. And what turned the tide of the, in the First World War um, in Palestine were two main battles um, for Beersheba, which was uh, in the Jordan Valley. And so this pole actually, in, it's captured some of the colours of the desert there, but also how it reflects back to, you know, Australian landscapes. Um, the, there's a canvas strip twisted around it with um, any feathers because the digger's slouch hat um, had a, a khaki canvas band around it and a plume of emu feathers and that was the hat for um, the, the light horse regiments. So this pile actually has inscribed into the enamels, um, the names of, well, it names all of the regiments and it names um, the light horsemen who died during the First World War in the Jordan Valley during two offensives. And um, there's, you know, a range of, of daubs of wattle um, in yellows and different colors up and down the, that pole because we have lots of, um, you know, recorded history. The men took wattle, you know, sprigs of wattle pressed in the pages of their notebooks to war to remind them of home. So that's there. The names are inscribed in long verticals, so like spears and at the top, although you can't see it well in that, um, there's a series of, you know, like spearhead type shapes drawn into the enamel, and so that it's inferring the men themselves with the weapons used in the battle. So, you know, and there's some, some really interesting, you know, there, there's so much more research to do and so much more of these that can be done. So I haven't finished on that series yet. <laughs> Um, so, okay, Sabia has had um, early this year Masters of Glass exhibition in um, April and May was on containers. And these are based on traditional fish scoops. So the idea was that when you built the stone barriers across the creeks and the rivers and trapped pools of water and the fish were in there, there were woven, basically woven circles that were folded over a bit like a taco and stitched um, partly at the, around the rims and left the opening at the top and then they were used to scoop the fish out. Um, and fish scoops are fascinating things. There's a number of fascinating woven objects that I'm just beginning to engage with. So the these are the fish scoops. This one was called the oyster shell fish scoop because it had the colours of oyster shell in the cane. So again, that's cane work in the patterning, but very fine cane work. Um, Jenny, are there examples is, of these um, scoops in museums there? Yes, there yeah. are. Yeah. Huh. So, um, and they're worth having a look at because they're rather gorgeous. And mm -hmm. there's also these conical um, woven objects where they fold it over and stitch down, kind of leave the top open like an ice cream cone. And, um, and they were winnowing baskets for the grasses. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm, we're just starting to play with some of those ideas as well. So the greens in this were based on seed grasses. Um, and then the other thing that I've been doing, I've been, that's, you know, helped out and keeping me afloat during COVID because some of the, obviously, commercial galleries are restricted. Um, they're making lots of exhibitions available through the digital catalogues and online. Um, and they're doing, you know, viewings in the gallery by appointment only. 
So some of them are opening up more now and in by July they'll be almost back to normal. But some of the um, issues that, sorry, some of the, the um, issues with that is that you know, while you might expect to have more sales, it's kind of now you don't know how many sales you're going to get um, through galleries. Although I have had some, it's not sort of been as many as I might have if two more people were going in to physically look at the work. Um, this is the Art City yeah. Awards, First Nations for, um, Fine Art Awards. And so um, I made their awards last year and these are the ones from this year, which were presented on the 27th of May. Um, so this was the uh, hot loan by Coronial Basket on its base and they applied the name Clark on, to, on the base, to go on the base. Um, for the Fellowship of Award and it was given to Marie Clark in Victoria. I don't know if you know Marie, but she's also been up to the Glassworks to do some work in the hot shop this year, in the last year as well. So it's been exciting. It was good to see her get this. Uh, this was the Dreaming Award given to an emerging artist and that went to Thea um, Perkins, as Hetty's daughter, um, has become an amazing artist. I think she won, she was shortlisted for the Archibald Prize, Portraiture Prize this year, which is a big deal. And she won the Alice Prize as well. So she's, and so it was kind of like the Coolerman for her. Um, and then we had, a First Nations Experimental Art Award, which was a mainstream Australia Council Award. Um, and so because it was experimental, we kind of looked at, you know, my idea was um, to try and capture the creative spirit in what pushes people forward. So this was the award for that, which is hot sculpted glass. So um, these awards have pushed me actually to do something different. Um, the fish scoop that went to um, Ship Award as well for, I think for community arts that went to a young woman who uses arts as uh, to strengthen identity and build people up in the community and she works across digital media and theatre. Um, hey, hey Jenny, really quick, um, since you were just showing another fish scoop, um, we have a question mm -hmm. from Brooke. She's wondering if your fish scoop, she says, these are amazing. Are they on display anywhere in Canberra, Australia to be seen in person post COVID? Do you have any plans to exhibit? Um, I got some, they're not in Canberra, they're actually um, at Sabia, so in Sydney, so they can be seen there. I've still got maybe one or two in the studio, um, so if someone's in Canberra, if they want to, you know, so sort of when the glassworks is open to the public again, they can come in and see me there and see the fish scoops. Um, this was the Red Ochre Women's Award. So the Red Ochre Awards are for lifetime service um, in the arts. And this one um, was for, that went to Alison Carroll in the uh, at APY lands and Annabella has been the chair there for a long time, a long time practicing artist, um, which is fabulous. And um, so I was really pleased that she got that. And this is actually based on um, a new design where I'm looking at the fiber as it unwinds off of palm trees and things. And that was inspired by after, 
um, cyclone Yahtzee went through far north Queensland. I was visiting friends in Tully, which got hard hit just after the cyclone. And we went down along the beach and all the palm trees along the beach had this palm fibre around the trunks and it had all been stripped away and it was sort of left sticking out and floating and it had these these amazing cross weaves and things in it and so it's you know I took lots of photos and they've been something else that I've been thinking about trying to produce in in glass as well so this is um that's what happened in the the women's red okra award and the men's um, Okra Wood went to John Mundine, who's been over. I'm sure you know John. Um, yeah, John was here. just here last year as our keynote speaker for a um, symposium that we did. Mm. So the idea was a shield. So this is the back of the shield. Um, again, it's hot sculpted. It's made with um, triple twisted canes to try and get that cross-hatching idea that's in some of the older, you know, some of the historical shields that are so lovely. And this was the design for the front. And that was mounted on that, um, on that block in, in a, uh, a bracket where it just slides into the bracket and it's on a slight angle so it, it, you can see the light through it. Um, so again, this was um, using canes, as you can see, trying to map storylines and looking at some of the designs on the old shields as well, some of the historical shields, and do something that invokes both of those things. Um, so that was, um, that's what I've been up to <laughs> since I was at Clergy Roo, and I think that's, that's it as far as the um well don't don't close your powerpoint yet jenny because um we might have okay. questions about specific works but and actually okay. tess, tess alice has a question hey tess her god you joined um she's just wondering where those warrior poles that you showed us earlier where are those located now um there's uh let's see there's one in um well, two have gone to live in um, in the Philippines in, to collect a private collector in Manila. One is um, still at Sabia, but it's been created again. It's on. Um, it's been reserved for Cogoma in Brisbane. So they're looking for a donor to buy it for the art gallery. So. Um, it would be so beautiful to see those as public sculptures, Jenny. To well, see the idea, it, they should have gone to the Australian War Memorial, but they're extremely conservative. Um, mm -hmm. And they're not interested. Mm -hmm. And they were given the opportunity of having a private viewing at Sabia and all sorts of things, and they let it go. And so, you okay. know, they missed out. And there will be one pole which is based on um, Gallipoli and the men who fought at Gallipoli in the First World War and it, the pole is called Fallen and it was, I, it will be in Darwin in August in the exhibition at the Salon de Refusé. So that's, in fact, I'm in the process of creating it now so it's going to Darwin next week. <laughs> Um, along with other works for Paul Johnson for his gallery, but um, the um, that one is um, a really interesting poem. Um, it has the traditional warrior shield design on the front, and carries the names of the Aboriginal soldiers who died at Gallipoli. So there's a lot of work still to do, but um, if someone wants to look at those ones again. Um, it's really too so bad that the War Memorial turned them down. Gosh, they're such an interesting, yeah. yeah. Well, they're incredibly conservative. Um, 
I have ultimate conservative um, people on the board, including Tony Abbott, who's another one who, yeah. So, um, you know, and it's, uh, they have very few works by Aboriginal artists. They do have, um, there's one um, Aboriginal artist was commissioned to do a series of paintings for them. And, um, and apart from that, not very much. But they also refuse to acknowledge the frontier wars. Right. Um, Tess says, thank you, Jenny. I'll, I'll have to head up to Brisbane soon for a look at it. Everyone else, if you have any questions, feel free to write them in the Q&A. I have a quick, oh, here we go. Um, oh, this is, and Tess says, I'm truly loving how Jenny is pushing herself into new, into new directions. It's very exciting to see. So I would agree with that statement. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we have a question from Brooke. She says, is it ever difficult to balance to balance um, to balance uh, the representation of your identities in your work for example not only are you an Aboriginal artist you're an Oriental artist but also a gla glass artist and a female artist etc well I actually don't even worry about that I just do what I do and people perceive it as they perceive it so what seems to have emerged is that, you know, on the one hand, I'm seen as an Aboriginal artist, but I also show in mainstream galleries like Savia and, um, and I've been, you know, shown at Corning and that. So that's actually given me, you know, a, a, a reputation as a glass artist and something some people will even consider if they really like the work and then other people will buy the work because it's by an Aboriginal person. So um, I tend not to worry about balancing them. I just do what I need to do. So... And um, and the other other thing that I did this year was actually had have uh, work in the women's show in March at the Vivian Anderson Gallery in Melbourne. So and I haven't had a gallery in Melbourne before, but um, no, you all know Vivian, and you all know. Um, and actually, while I was there, Kent came in, so you know I got to get together with Kent Morris as well, and. We've kept in touch with by email and things. So it's been that <clears throat> there's a lot of those Kluge Roo connections. <laughs> yeah, there are. Jenny, I have um I have a question for you. So those voice cores that you showed us at the very beginning, those are fascinating. I'm wondering yes. if you've ever thought about exhibiting them or installing them with any sound. Um <clears throat> I actually have. Um, but for that exhibition, there wasn't actually enough time mm -hmm. to think about that. But um, I have thought about it because um, the museum, the Australian Museum in Sydney have a series of, they have an installation outside the museum in a courtyard. And you approach through it and it is, again, it's a series of wooden poles, so it's trees, trunks, and it has designs, but it also has um, sound installed. So you, as you walk past each one, it activates the sound and you're listening to stories in the traditional languages of the Sydney area. Mm which is really quite beautiful and that it incorporates, you know, sounds of the sea and the wind and, and sounds from the environment. So it's really beautiful. And then a mainstream artist in Canberra, Harriet Schwarzrock, has done a series of amazing popcorn glass hearts, which is filled with um, different gases like neon, 
gases. There's four different gases and each one has a different color. And um, when you touch the heart, move your finger up at the light was like a piece of lightning, colored lightning that follows your finger. She did a, a big installation um, of them in the gallery at Canberra Glassworks. And in one section, she worked with a sound engineer to incorporate sound. And that sound was um, looked at magnifying the sounds of the gases inside the hearts. So it was like another pulse, um, you know, and, and that was extraordinary. And um, after I left Kluge Roo, when I was in Washington, I went to a gallery, um, which was probably America's first gallery of modern art, really, because it was a predated MoMA in New York um, and the Guggenheim. But there was um, an extraordinary sculpture there with, made of metal car parts. It was made in the 1920s, but when you walked past it, it activated sound and it played sort of wind instrument sounds that varied as you, according to your pace and how close you were to it. Um, and, you know, so sound has been, you know, lots of things have been sound of triggering the idea of using sound. So that's something else for the future. <laughs> yeah, I could I could see this idea of the voice cores together with the with the warrior pulse too, bringing those voices of those um, mm. of yeah. the deceased sort of back or to the present or you know I don't know I there's so many cool I can see you doing such interesting things with that. Um, I <laughs> well, also, I think we also have a renewed interest and. In, impetus on um, reclaiming Indigenous languages mm -hmm. now that has been happening for quite a while. And so connecting with those organisations and um, looking at asking them to participate in some way would be really good. Yeah, that would be really, oh, I just want to see that. I want to see it happen. <laughs> <laughs> um. yeah. No, you'll just have to get me to come back to clear your room. Yeah, we will. We'll just have to get you to come back, Jenny. Someone says, absolutely amazing work. Thank you for sharing. Keeping culture alive, exclamation point. So really excited about that. Um, my, I had a, also a comment about your Feather Sky. Um, sorry, I'm forgetting the other word in the title. Yeah, Feather Nest Sky. Feather Nest Sky, yes. Um, yeah. What I loved about those is this idea of the of feathers as being so light um yes. and but also strong um and like the forms that you're drawing inspiration from these baskets after just having done a whole exhibition on them and teaching with them you know they're the same way they're like made of wood and the strong palm fiber and they're incredibly strong symbols of cultural vitality but they're also so lightweight um, I don't know, there's some connection there that felt really, really interesting to me between feathers and the materials used to make the forms that you're recreating in glass. And then also the contrast between that, like the physical lightness of those materials with the heaviness of the glass is really interesting. Too. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, those pieces were interesting because I've um, you know, I've always got feathers around somewhere that, you know, I pick up feathers all the time. And um, one of the things I want to incorporate in the, the, the jewellery making is, is feathers as well. I but wanted to ask I, you about the jewellery making, Jenny, because it's such a small scale compared to your glass work. Yes. And I know you work <laughs> at various scales, but... Um, there's something so intimate about it in a very specific and also because it's worn on the body and has yes. a whole other thing. And then also fascinating textures in your, in your jewelry pieces. Mm -hmm. And so yes. it makes me, I'm just sort of noticing how varying the scale is that you're working at. And then also how yeah. these jewelry pieces really incorporate texture in a way that, um, your glass pieces do it in, in terms of matte or shiny, but I was mm. thinking about like imprinting texture into the glass, if that's ever anything that interests you. 
Well, this is, you know, these pieces were all done during, you know, like the dilly bag is done. Um, you, you create it in, in wax first. So that, that texture was created by rolling in a, a, um, a casuarina seed across the wax. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it, it's there. Um, and you get this lovely textural thing. And also, I think the this one, the texture, the actual texture of, of an actual piece of net. Um, and looking at the knots in this, they're very similar to the nets, you know, that are in the Kluge Roo collection, mm -hmm. except they're much, the ones in the collection, they are finer than this. Although this looks quite fine. Um, when you wear it, um, but the um, when you you look at the twining and the texture of the fibre and then the texture of the knotting is very very similar, and um, that's one of the things. I think I did lots of drawings in the collection of those knots mm -hmm. and fibres, so they're something else that I've been carrying around. I like textures um, and I do a lot of photography so there's a whole, um, I don't know, a whole category in my photography that's just based on textures, whether it's textures of the grass or trees or rocks or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. It's the textural quality that's really important. So, you know, and I like the, the wax, pro, the lost wax process and the casting process. Like I've done some beaten metal work, which has been interesting. Um, but, and that gives you another opportunity to use textures, mm -hmm. but not in the same way. So, um, you know, this is just drawing into a, uh, was drawing into a, a sheet of wax. Mm -hmm. and sending it off to be cast. Um, so doing those things, and then again, you know, the objects, the opportunity to incorporate objects. And apart from this being, you know, a, a souvenir of America and the places I've been, um, I one of the things that I have from the First World War and my uh, my grandfather, who was the Ripley, he also served in his, he sent home lots of postcards, but he brought home Egyptian coins mm -hmm. that he um, had made into a bracelet. One of them collection of coins he had made into a bracelet for my grandmother. So... You know, I've, and she always collected coins after that. So, <laughs> you know, there's all these little threads running through. Um, so, and, you know. Metaphorically and literally in this case. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. We have two more comments. Tess says, um, she says, uh, she says um, uh, that the feather nest works are truly spectacular. And Ivana says, not a question, but a compliment. Bravo, Ginny, on an amazing and diverse creative practice from your big fan in Sydney. Sadly, I have to sign off now. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> that's um, lovely. But um, unless we don't, I think that's all the questions it, it looks like right now. Is, is there anything else you want to say? We're really so grateful for you sharing these things. It's been, I, I found it personally very interesting to see how prolific you are. I remember this from before, but you are incredibly <laughs> prolific. And it's so cool because such a small amount of time can pass and um, so much you, you can have pursued so many ideas already in your work. So thank you so much for sharing with us. And I think it's very well, exciting it's, to see the fiber work come into the glass work, Jenny, with your hanging glass pieces. Yeah. I think yes, cool. and so there's going to be more of those. And yeah. um, I'm going to incorporate some weaving into one of the long um, fish traps as well. Cool. So can't wait to, can't wait to see it. <laughs> Thank you, Lauren and Jenny and everyone at the Kluge Roo. Thanks. Well, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks so much, Jenny. We'll, we'll be in touch. 
Okay. Bye. No worries. Thank you. Okay. Bye. <laughs>